Welcome to Atomic Life. This is Kurt Havens, and today we are back with Big Paul. How's it going, Paul? What's up, man? I'm at the end of contest prep. Brain what dead. Run, <laughs> running on low you? carbs. Uh, you'll see. Yeah, I think if my math is right. Let's see. Sunday. Yeah, so 18 days. Yeah, that's right. 18 days. Very cool. Something so like that. Days I, don't know. I can't add right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we were going to talk about your transition from your off season right last year into prep and what that looked like yeah we're going to talk about cycles this is the stuff the meaty stuff that everybody loves to talk about they want to hear what you're taking how much you're taking it was hilarious man like i had some dude on my channel comment the other day i posted up my before and after pics and he's like that's impossible without roids and i'm like are you new here man like have you <laughs> have you watched my channel i don't i talk about everything i i'm probably too open with it but yeah we can go into detail i it, and you know i wanted to hear your opinion on what i'm doing and why i'm doing it I'll, I'll explain my logic on things but i'll pull my screen up i am super ocd for anybody that <laughs> knows me i literally have years and years of logs of training of peds of my food i keep track of everything i'm i'm a computer scientist by trade i have a degree in computer science and it's primarily in information information analysis things like data statistics things like that so i love looking at data and crunching data but sometimes you can get dig in too much into the weeds with this shit but it's neat to look back and see what you did right and what you did wrong and kind of parse things out and have some data to operate on i found that to be true with business and with bodybuilding, if you have accurate information to measure, you can make changes and gauge progress more effectively and manipulate variables to accommodate for growth and for progress. That's that's what I found. Yep, I agree. I have similar notes going back years. What do you uh, so you want to start with your off season? Yeah, we can talk so, about my off not- season. So last year I competed in June. And my show was middle of June and I came off and I did my typical rebound, which was something like, I think last year I ran 500 milligrams. I don't have that on the sheet that we're looking at, but if I recall correctly, I ran 500 milligrams of test and 150 milligrams of MPP. It was very low on the rebound. You're going to get super compensation just from the food. And that's when the majority of your growth comes from. So I use that as a time to recover while running lower doses without completely pulling down to TRT. I think a lot of guys goof up coming out of shows, pulling down to TRT or coming off completely. You're really missing that window of opportunity for growth. If you just stay on a moderate amount of PEDs, keep your diet together, you're not going to have this huge fat gain that I see a lot of people have after shows. So I ran that for something like eight to 10 weeks. Then I did a cruise. And then I started up my off season in the fall of last year and promptly hurt my shoulder. I tore my leg from doing pull-ups. And so I thought there was no sense in running a blast while I was recovering from torn labrum. And not that it's fully recovered. I never had the surgery. So I just ran TRT, real TRT, like 125 milligrams with two units of GH for about four or five months. What did that do to your composition? What do you look like? I got a little mushy, but I didn't really lose any weight. It was surprising when I came down to TRT. I actually gained strength during that phase. It was really weird, man. (laughs) And I don't know why. Maybe it was just washing off some of the toxicity from the drugs. But I felt like I got stronger and actually made progress running just TRT. People aren't going to believe that. Well, sleep, right? Yes, sleep sleep. vastly improved. Sleep, yeah, sleep was a lot better. And, you know, after after a while when you run large doses that you just start to feel lethargic, you start to feel tired, you start to feel run down your body, just kind of is fighting back against you. And I feel like that impairs your ability to perform well in the gym. Agree a hundred percent. Believe me, I would have rather pushed. I would have rather. It's not always the time to push. I mean, it's wise to reset. But my logic was, is let's just pull back down. So really my off season for, this contest that I'm currently going into started in April of of this year. And that's when I finally felt up to training harder and moving back on to a cycle. So I'll, sh- I'll show you what I did here. I, this, is, this is how I measure everything out. And you can see how, if I need to make this bigger, I taper up 
when I let me uh, let me make this a little bit bigger so people can see. While you're doing that, I was just going to clarify something. When I said it's it makes sense to I clean up or clean out whatever I just said, I didn't mean come off. I just I spoke to an athlete today who his coach had him come completely off for some reason after a show, and his testosterone his total test was a seventy eight. Yeah, it seems like the so dumbest it, thing you that's can really do. dumb. Especially in the post show window, because you're you're in a very fragile state at that point, and then you create a hormonal environment where you're estrogen dominant. Yeah, and I would think it cortisol's through the roof. I would think that that is a recipe to get fat. And that I've was kind it. of the outcome. Yeah. Whereas if you stay on a moderate amount of anabolics, you keep your food buttoned up. And you push. I usually get a little aggressive with the food post show. If you push, you can leverage that into some of the best gains that you have for the whole year. Usually what I find is in that eight to 10 week window post show, if I keep things together, if I can keep myself together, I'll regain all my contest weight that I lost and get back up to my off season weight, but at a leaner body composition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I I think. Every year, I feel like you just in general, your composition should be improving, right? And you've seen I mean, that. Essentially, my last three shows, I have progressed up in stage weight. I was 185 three years ago. It was yeah. pretty bad. I was, you know, low 230s last year. I don't know where I'm going to be this year, probably low 240s on stage, something like that. But my off season weight was the same each year. I was somewhere between 270 and 280. Yeah, just your body fat's lower, your muscle mass is heavier. My body fat was lower. I kept myself leaner in the offseason, and I recalibrated my body composition. It's almost like your body has a set point, a homeostatic point that it wants to stay at, and, but you can kind of work around that and trick that into being leaner at that same body weight that what you were before. That's what I found. It just takes time, right? Your hypothalamus has to get used to that weight, so yep. it takes a couple weeks or whatever, a couple months. So what I started with this off season, and this is typically how I do cycles, I taper up. So week one, I was at 375 tests, 150 milligrams of nandrolone, more specifically NPP. I run NPP because I have had problems with nandrolone in the past with anxiety, sexual dysfunction, and I want a quick exit if I have a problem. That's why I I run with MPP. It's not that there's something specifically I feel that's better about MPP over DECA. It's just that I want the ability to get on and get off quickly. And then Primo. I ran 300 milligrams of Primo. That's what I started off with. Yep. And then you titrated up. And then I titrated up from there. You can see I was running five units of growth hormone. At that time, it was just generic growth hormone, UGL, generic growth hormone. I was running Lantus at 25 units every day with the high carbs. I mm-hmm. I don't talk about it a ton, but I seem to have some sort of pancreatic deficiency. I have been told by doctors that they believe that I am a type 1B diabetic. I've never gotten a formal diagnosis, but it does run in my family. And it's really a weird type of diabetes that almost no white people have. I was told that it's predominantly in Asian men. But... My pancreas does not seem to produce enough insulin to keep up with the carbohydrates. I've tried it. I went through, they originally put me on metformin and it made no difference in my fasting glucose levels. And then we did a fasting insulin test and we monitored my insulin levels and noticed that my insulin levels were very low. So it was not a, an issue with insulin resistance. It was an issue with producing. Uh, producing insulin. So I run Lantus and I think a lot of people get confused about the role that Lantus plays. Lantus is not to replace mealtime insulin production, right? Yep. It's Uh, background. Yeah. It's a background insulin. It's the basal insulin that's running and present at all times. So 25 units sounds like a lot to people. They're thinking Humalog. If you took 25 units of Humalog, (laughs) you might be dead on the floor. But that 25 units is spread out over a, a, I think Lantus has a 23 or a 25 hour lifetime, something like that. So it's, yeah. it, it, there is a little bit of a curve to it, but it's, it, you're somewhere around two to two and a half units per hour. And then it tapers off from there. Yep. And it has a weird, it, it has a weird metabolism where it basically flattens out 
And you probably Correct. find it's less than 23 in you, right? I feel like most bodybuilders, it's shorter. It's very, you know, 12 hours, 15 Yeah, hours. and I've heard of people dosing it twice a day. I have not tried that. I run it at know. night. And that's, if you look at the instructions, it actually says to run it at night to help with fasting glucose levels. Yep. Because normally you would get an insulin spike a couple hours after you go to bed. So it's just mimicking right. that. And then so it sort of tails off towards the end of the day. Um, and then I run Humalog on the high days with okay. my with my every other meal. So Humalog has an, an active life of something like three to five hours. It, yep. It's it starts to tail off after three hours if you look at it. So just to be conservative, I don't want to run it every meal. I want I run it every other meal and let it let it tail off and then hit it again. And then what I'll do is test my glucose levels pre meal to see where I'm at, and I will just adjust the doses base off of my glucose level. Yep. So I don't, a lot of people want to have this prescribed dose of insulin going into meals. That's just a dumb way to do it. I let my glucose levels dictate what I need. Yep. Just like a diabetic. Correct. But most people are too dumb to do the math to figure that out. But that's why they get in trouble with things like insulin. Yeah. I, I see guys dose insulin and then they eat to match the dose, which is really stupid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Opposite. And on the high days, you know, from, from working with me, Kurt, we keep the fats to close nothing. to yep. nothing as possible. So if you're running insulin, you're <laughs> running high carbohydrates, what's going to happen to the, any dietary fat that you're taking in? It's going to get shuttled right to your muscles. <laughs> or into fat source, you know, or yeah, you don't want to, it, it's butt more, more fat source, I'm sorry, but you don't want, you don't want intercellular triglycerides either. Correct. So that's what I do. And, and you can see here, we taper off the cycle as we go. So I, I progressed, I ended up dropping, you can see here, I dropped the, yep. the nandrolone around week seven. The reason why I, I dropped that. it, yep. I started having panic attacks and it didn't happen until I pushed up to the 300. So maybe 300 was too much for me. Maybe I should just run a little bit for the additional nitrogen retention in the added benefit for the joints. But I, I, I found that what agrees with me the best over the years, and it seems like most pro bodybuilders end up somewhere here, is testosterone and Primo or testosterone and Equipoise. Yep. Those are the two that seem to agree the most with me. And you'll note that I did not run an AI on this either. I kept track of my, I get blood work done every, you know, eight weeks or so. I kept track of my, my estradiol and it stayed in the 50 to 60 range, which okay. I think was okay, fine. Nice yeah, that's great. So it looks like from stuff I'm working on, it looks like the ideal range, assuming androgens are in an appropriate place. It's like 40 to 80. After 80, there's a huge it drop benefit. Yeah. Um, I never, yeah, great. I don't know how much merit there is to it, but I heard Dr. Eric Serrano speak at Swiss and he said that his rule of thumb is you want your estradiol to be at a 20 to one ratio of your your free testosterone. I've not seen that formally written. It's not to say it's wrong. No. And I've, I've never, never seen, seen there's no documented way to measure when you're on androgens, right? We know what it is in a natural individual, but, but that seems a little high to me, yeah. especially, you know, when, you know, at this level, I mean, my testosterone levels were like 4,500. Yeah. So when we, I don't know. And, and we can do another video on this too, but there's problems with this new trend where guys are pushing their estrogen higher and higher and higher, expecting more growth. The problem is we produce something called insulin growth factor binding protein one that basically renders your IGF useless, even though it shows a serum in your blood. So running your estrogen at the level he suggests, depending on where that takes it, over 80 is going to, it's not going to be beneficial. Yeah, there seems to be this cult of running estrogen super high, which I don't necessarily agree with. I just anecdotally speaking, I have found that somewhere in just at the top of the normal range or slightly over the top of the normal yep. range is where I, I feel the best and seem to get the most growth. Yeah. If I get so much higher than 60, my PP doesn't work. Yep. Your mood <laughs> is probably bad. Mood is bad. It's just like every I start getting gyno flare ups. I start getting bloated. Yeah. So, so we, I, I don't know, you and I probably talked about this before, but for people, if this is the first time they've heard of this, where a lot of this data is coming from 
is twofold. It's so estrogen obviously has some health benefits, right? It protects your kidneys and your heart and your brain, your joints. And there is data to show that using an aromatizing steroid will cause more growth than a non-aromatizing steroid. Where the people go wrong is they're taking data from Tremblone with cattle, where they use estradiol mixed in, and cattle don't produce insulin growth factor binding protein one. So when you take a cow's estradiol really high, it'll still continue to grow and produce more IGF. In a human, it doesn't work that way. And estrogen in humans, male and female, is not technically a growth factor. Estrogen doesn't cause growth in women, progesterone does, and in men, it's generally testosterone. So estrogen might aid in that growth, but estrogen's not driving muscular growth per se, right? In nature, if your estrogen were elevated, something would be wrong. It wouldn't mean it's time to grow tissue. It's interesting how it's changed in bodybuilding because I've been at this for a long time and 15, 20 years ago, it was crush your estrogen, crush your estrogen, keep it as low, run an AI year, year round. Or two AIs. Yeah, or two AIs. I've seen dudes even run three on contest prep. That's that's sort of the old school way of doing doing things. I don't understand what the logic is there. There's only so low you can take your estrogen. But I I have found, just speaking for myself, that at the high end of the normal range or slightly over is ideal for me. If I get much higher than that, then I just feel like shit. It's just that simple. So I titrated up. I Chase Irons inspired me. I wanted to see pushing the <laughs> doses up a little bit higher. I At my peak off season, I got up to 1,500 test, 1,200 primo. That was peak off season. It was 1,500 test, 1,200 primo. And nine units, I have nine and a half units of GH in here. And that was split between half generic, half serostem. Serostem. So that's where i got to and i eventually backed off the primo a little bit i noticed that when i was at 1200 primo that my estrogen got down it was yep. down like 12 13. <laughs> yep so we and you and i have discussed this before and god yep. and i've discussed this before so primo acts as an anti-estrogen a suicide anti-estrogen and it does that through one of its metabolites so this yeah, is well, why you didn't necessarily need to run an AI because you technically were running an AI by using Primo. And the dose, the higher you bring that dose, the more it's going to uh, obviously affect I that. I remember you mentioning the metabolite. What was the name of it again? Um, I'm putting you on the spot. Arimistine, you know, I, I'll look it up. I forget. But anyway, at 1,200, I found that's the highest I've ever run Primo. I found that it crushed my estrogen so i pulled it back down to a thousand my estrogen came up a little bit and then i eventually settled in at 1500 test 800 primo okay that seems like a probably a better place to be so in at 1500 test 800 primo that put me up around that i came back up to about in the 50s i think is where my estrogen dial i don't have my blood work in front of me but that's where yeah, I ended that's, up. A, that's a pretty good place to be but the irony here this is the weird part kurt when I got to the end of this block, I was, wasn't sure if I should cruise going into my show just to give myself a health break. I went and got my blood panels done. At 1,500 test and 800 primo and nine and a half units of GH, my blood work looked the best that it had in a couple of years. Not surprising. It, it was it was really, really, really weird. <laughs> everything, every, The only thing that was elevated was hematocrit was a little up. Hemoglobin was a little up, but that's everybody that takes PEDs. Yeah. I, you don't see any blood panels of people that take PEDs. My cholesterol was in line. Everything, you know, reasonably in line. My HDL was was mildly suppressed. I think it was in the mid thirties, but that's also about as good yeah. as it gets when you're when you're yeah. on PEDs. LDL, I'd never see anybody below hundred except on contest prep. That's just you can get if no. you can get close to hundred. That's about as good as it gets. Yeah. The, Unless you're running a statin. True. Yeah, that is a good point. The metabolite from Prion Bond is called Adamastain. Adamastain. Okay. Yeah, somebody was asking me about that the other day, so I was interested. I'll send that to you. So at 729, we I made a soft shift into prep mode. Really, the only thing that changed, essentially, I am doing a 12-week prep. I didn't really, I stayed pretty lean in the off-season. And really, I, I the only thing I changed is I lowered the test dose a little bit, and I pulled out one high day. That's added a little tiny bit of cardio for the first, instead of doing zero, which Justin, does, don't 
put your hands over your ears. You don't hear that. I was doing <laughs> zero in the off season. I know I shouldn't do that. I'm going to be better about it this year. But I transitioned to doing four 20 minute sessions a, a week. Okay. It wasn't anything crazy. And that was the first 12 weeks. So really prep for me, drug protocol officially began at at 12 weeks out. And you'll see here the HDH shifted to nine units. That's because I just started running completely serostone at this point. I was running half a vial of serostone a day. Whether it's any different than running the generics, I don't know. Maybe. No. I feel like I get less side effects. Of course, that could be just all in my head. Yeah. I mean, in theory, right, it should be better. But again, who knows? So you'll see here, we shifted to 1,000 test, 800 primo, or yeah, 800 primo for the first four weeks of contest prep. There were no orals added in then and no fat burners added in yet. I didn't, I save, I think of that stuff as like a, a card in my hand to save it for when I need it. And especially with the fat burners, I want to, in the cardio, I want to run what's necessary to get me to the point of leanness that I need to be at, but not more. I have made that mistake in the past where I've done too much cardio and run too many fat burners and running things like T3 and T3. stuff like that. And then you just end up melting all your muscle away. So it's a fine line to walk. Some people need it. Some people have a hard time losing fat. I'm not one of them. So this is one of those things where as a good contest prep coach, you have to understand your client and how they respond to things and adjust accordingly. You can't have a one size fits all protocol for everybody. You just can't. Yep. And just like you tapered up in the off season, you, you do the same thing with doses here. So you're, same you're thing constantly here. adjusting. Same thing here. And I felt like the 1,800 at this point, I am not in the mode of adding size. So uh, this is sort of a limbo. I probably could have done even less. But I felt like I would use that for first four weeks of where I'm just sort of transitioning into prep. This is a thing that I remind people of when I coach people on contest prep. Your job is to not lose muscle, to burn fat, and not get hurt on contest prep. Mm -hmm. And I feel almost guilty mentioning it, but I saw that Nick Walker just tore his hamstring yeah. at the end of contest prep, and he was doing heavy stiff-legged deadlifts is that what he was doing when he tore yep yep that's what i that's what i heard that he was doing heavy stiff-legged deadlifts which is not smart at the end of contest prep so i am not pushing things to failure on contest prep and i'm layering an extra gear as i ramp up the fat burners and i ramp up the cardio and that is more for an anti-catabolic effect and yep. cosmetic effect I'm not trying to grow muscle. This whole notion of growing into shows, I get guys all the time tell me, why don't you grow into shows? There's been one person in the history of humanity Arnold. that I know of that could do that. Maybe Arnold, Kevin oh, LeBron. Sean. Yeah, Kevin LeBron. Yeah, I am not that person. Not at 50 years old. And I would say nobody I train is that person. No. Maybe if you're super lean, if you start off in single digit body fat, maybe you can do that. I, that might be the, the caveat. But who is that? Nobody. So you see here at 12 weeks out, we officially made the shift. I, I went up to six days a week of cardio at 20 minutes at that point. Five days. Yeah, six, five days, I think is what I shifted to. What cardio were you doing? Justin's going to murder me, but he always tells me he wants me doing hit. I don't do the damn hit, man. I just do steady state. Okay. I feel like hit... The, the you know i i understand like the whole epoch thing which i think has been mostly debunked if you look it's at some modern studies proven. yeah justin loves hit i do not i feel like the fatigue that you accumulate maybe for a young guy it's better but at my age i fatigue management is very very important for me keeping an eye on fatigue as we progress into contest prep, because if you're not sleeping, if you feel like shit, you're going to look like shit on stage. I yep. see a lot of guys get on stage, especially masters competitors that look completely haggard. So that's something I'm trying to be mindful of. We want to walk it up to the line, but not across the line. Yep. Yeah, I would agree. I think hit cardio is obviously going to burn more calories, right? Cause it's tougher, but I noticed the same thing, just the central nervous fatigue, the, 
Um, I tend to lose leg size when I do stuff yep. like that. It melts my um, legs. And, and so you're, yeah, you might be losing more fat, but you're losing more size. You're losing more energy. And that energy is better devoted into something else like training to keep your muscle mass. Like and at the mind. end of the day, the way I look at it, it's net energy balance at the end of the yeah. day anyway. Yes. And how many more calories are you really burning from doing Nothing. hit? No, not that much. 50? Yeah, not the <laughs> best, right. At, you know, 350 a week, I mean, over a 16 week content prep, we're talking about maybe a pound of fat. I don't know that, that that's worth the additional fatigue that you accumulate. Yeah. And it probably washes out anyway, because of that and any muscle that you would lose. My legs just flatten out when I do yeah, that. And I think that you, you adapt to aerobic exercise really quickly anyway. So even if you're initially burning, you know, 300 calories versus a hundred doing low intensity that you adapt to it. And then you, it's probably equal at the end. Yes. So is it really I, more? I don't know. I transition my cardio as I progress through prep. So the deeper I am in, I go to less intense cardio. So I start off generally on the stepper. Then at some point I go to the elliptical. And then at some point I'll transition to just walking on the treadmill. And everybody feels like they, this is another thing that makes me laugh too, is people I hear people say that you're soft and other coaches say you're soft. If you're not walking on the treadmill at a 10 incline, if you look at the math on it or whatever, I'm just, you know, I'm yeah, throwing a yeah. facetious number out there, but yeah. another, another thing I look at how much of a difference does it make in calories burned walking on an incline versus walking flat versus the fatigue it causes? No, a ton more fatigue. And just right. because the treadmill, the, the, the meter on the treadmill says the calories are good. It doesn't mean that in the human body, it's doing that it really makes almost no difference math wise. Yeah. And what I, what I found is that when I walk on the incline, I end up, my hips hurt. I end up getting shin splints and then I can't train my legs hard. And I think that washes out any benefit I get from it. So right now I'm at 30 minutes of walking with maybe like a one or a two incline, just a little bit. Yep. Wesley and I talked about this too. He was just doing, he goes for a walk in the morning before he eats breakfast yep. and then he walks in between each meal. That's all he does. He's not doing any dedicated cardio per se. Yeah. And he's got to be approach. as lean. I I would say he's at, as lean, if not leaner than Chris Bumstead. Yeah. And that's a smart approach. He's managing his fatigue and being smarter about things. It's really about energy expenditure at the end of the day. It that's It's just that simple. You either eat less or you burn more calories yeah. through exercise and neat. It's, yep. it's just, it's just that simple. Yeah. And a strategy that I've used with people in the past, probably similar to you is guys that are tend to be heavier, naturally heavier, you would use more cardio, right? And less fat burners and Correct. guys that tend to be leaner, you can get by with more fat burners and less cardio. Like I don't need, I'm a smaller guy, so I don't need as much cardio as someone who's naturally heavier. Yeah. Like I mean, I max out at 30 thinning. minutes. I, I, with my clients, my max that I'll have somebody do is two 40 minute sessions a day. Wow. Still. still yeah. And it's a lot. It's I've a lot. had a few people that have been pretty obese when they start contest prep and we've had to bury them with that. It's just what you need to get things off. And it's, I feel bad for them because they're having to suffer through things that I don't have to do myself. I generally don't like to tell people to do things that I'm not doing myself. For me, it would just make me small. Yes. But yeah. But the, you, not every strategy, like you said, works right. for everybody. You can't, you, I, you and I couldn't do, I couldn't do 80 minutes of cardio a day. My approach with clients, I have a rate of fat loss that I'm looking for, which is generally one to two pounds per week. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it and you break the math down on it, two pounds a week of true fat loss is a thousand a calorie a day that net energy deficit. That is a lot. It's a lot. You can't really get much more extreme than that. Not safely. Right. No, and no I feel can. like when you push much higher than that, it's you're, you're risking losing muscle. So yep. realistically, if you want to preserve your muscle and get on stage, you have 15 wet weeks. The peak week is not a fat burning week. Nope. Peak right. week is to fill back out and to basically deload and give yourself a break and be fresh for the stage. So if we're pushing things to the limit, that's two pounds per week. We have about 30 pounds of fat that we can burn at full throttle to get you on stage. So you better stay within 30 pounds of, of stage weight or you're going to be miserable on prep and probably lose yep. lose oh, muscle yeah 
Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me to get heavier than that in the offseason for no reason. But circling back, my logic, how I'll approach it with clients is I don't get too hung up on the scale. I will say that 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 two pound a week rule is applicable until you get down to single digit body fat. Once you get into single digit body fat, you just throw that out the window. I look at the pictures from week to week and see how composition is progressing. Like literally, I think I have weighed the same for the last three, four weeks. Like my... I'll go down, I'll go back up, I'll go down, I'll go back up, but I'm leaner. I'm looking lean. After my high day, I'll fill back up to whatever the weight was the previous week. So I, while the scale hasn't moved, I have gotten leaner. So that's just something to be mindful of at the end of prep. I think clients sometimes will get upset and worried that they're not losing weight. So I don't get too obsessed with the scale, but it is a measurement point. When you're at 20% body fat and you need to get down to 10, it is a more effective tool to use to monitor progress i will say yeah yeah i was and i was just going to clarify that it was what um you're basically saying that in the beginning obviously if someone has a significant amount of fat to lose the scale definitely matters right and they yes they should be paying attention to that but as you get leaner and leaner and leaner the scale becomes less relevant like i you and i look at your photos often right you probably send me photos a couple days and your weight is about the same but you look very different dramatically different every time I see photos. So whether you weigh at 240 every single time or not, it doesn't really matter at that point. Yeah. And I'll see that with my clients. So I do think there are some coaches that get too obsessed with the scale and some clients that get too obsessed with the scale, but it does matter when you're fat. And I will say, if you're beyond that 30 pounds of striking distance for a show, I wouldn't do a show. I would do a cut, get yourself within striking distance, hold there, and then take a break. Do it, basically what I'll do with people that want to compete that are obese is I'll do multiple cuts to get them ready to get them within striking distance of a show. Yep. Yeah. Not everyone I, is ready, to, you know, for their initial fat right. loss journey to get on stage. And I have found that 20 weeks is about the absolute maximum that you can push fat loss. Ideally, 12 to 16 is where you want to be. Once you get beyond that 12 to 16 week range, burnout metabolism starts to downregulate. calories get so low that you can't really go much lower cardio gets so high that you can't really push cardio much higher the fat burners get so high there's really not anywhere else to go and then the fat loss just sort of seems to stop there's some sort of metabolic adaptation that happens and you need a diet break and just give yourself like six to eight weeks to push the food back up and then you go at it again i was gonna say i could tolerate the longer the 20 or 26 week cut when i was younger in my 20s right. now i'm with you I, you know even eight weeks is seems like a long time to be dieting really right hard. you know 12 yeah 12 weeks is perfect if you can stay lean enough that you only need to diet for 12 weeks would be ideal so essentially with Most me i mean really my full court press for prep on this cycle was really only a, it's only 11 weeks yep so and you can see here at at 12 weeks out, this is when really I started to step on the gas and change things up a little bit. So, so you looks like you split up the, then you went from Primo to Primo and Master and you split the dose. Correct. You, you netted more milligrams, but you basically divided it. Pulled down the test, yep. added in the Master on, added in the Primo. And I, you and Dr. Todd recently discussed how Primo works as an AI and Master on works as a CERM. I... <laughs> I have, you know, people always ask me why I ran both. I didn't have a logical reason to present it. I just noticed that my body composition was better when I ran both side by side, that I stayed fuller with the Primo in the mix versus just running master on only. And maybe it has something to do with how those two, the metabolites and how those two affect estrogen in the body. I don't know. So master on because of it's, so it's an agonist of the alpha estrogen receptor. And what it's doing, it's causing mineral loss through aldosterone. So it's, you, you get that flat, you kind of get a flat, grainy, dry look from Astron right. alone with the Primo. You notice it. I've noticed it. I feel like the Primo look is a little fuller. It's yeah. Not, and I want to run that balance point. of being full and yep. being ripped too. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot, especially as a super heavyweight competitor. You're usually Rip doesn't win the super heavy no. division, and also at 12 weeks out, the last thing you need to be is too dry. 12 weeks out, correct. 
So, and this is what I ran here. And eventually fat burners will get added in. So you can see at 11 weeks out, I went to, I'm running the go pills from first attachment, but if you want to do, it's just essentially an ephedrine caffeine, Johimbine stack, 25 milligrams of bronchade, which is ephedrine. And the, I think there's 200 milligrams of caffeine and three and a half milligrams of Johimbine in the go pills, I believe is what it is. So just running that in the morning. That's what I started off with for my fat burners. And that was good enough to keep me on pace for burning, burning my fat. Some guys, and, I know, sorry, I was going to say ahead. Todd and I talked about this previously where some guys, I think he prefers clenbuterol. I, I'm an ephedrine guy. I layer the two, but what I'll do, because I've noticed that, here's what I've noticed. It seems like clenbuterol after a period of time, like six to eight weeks, just seems to stop working. Do you run... Um, Ketofen with it? No, I do not. But have you ever tried that? Mm -mm. So ketofen is an H1 a histamine agonist, and it re-ups the beta two receptor. Oh, so okay. the beta two receptor will stop really coming to the cell surface, and that's from the constant stimulation of clen. And the histamine receptor basically escorts the the beta receptor back to the cell surface. So if you run ketofen starting Again, this is not medical advice, but the if you run KDFUN starting at like the third week on, it it stops it from downregulating. You can also use it's not quite as effective, but you can use Enadryl. We'll do something similar as well. Interesting. I did not know that. But I, you know, anecdotally, what I found is that it just stops working after a period of time. So I layer it in, I save it for the end, and then I'll start ramping up the doses. So I and sometimes, like here recently, there's been some days I'll just pull the ephedrine out completely. Um, Justin typically has you run it twice a day. I found that if I run an AM and a PM dose, I can't sleep. Yep. That's the issue I run into. The so at nine, go ahead. Right. I was just going to say the biggest benefit I noticed from ephedrine versus clen is it, it seems to kill the appetite more. Where clen yes. doesn't really make you, it doesn't do anything for your appetite. You're just jittery. But you're still hungry, whereas ephedrine kind of kills that. I'm able to push through. I guess maybe I've done this so much, or I just don't have a huge appetite. Like I, I like to me, like being hungry, it's just like a background noise that I'm used to. I don't really like. I'm not one of these guys that feels like I'm dying or like I need to. Go. The main thing that bothers me with being in a caloric deficit is not the hunger; it's the brain fog. That's the part that in the lack of energy. When doing things, that's the part that gets me. So I hunger is not an issue for me. I get a lot of people think that semi-glutide is the miracle that they're looking for. Semi-glutide <laughs> is not a thermogenic. No, no. it's it just waste muscle and bone. Yeah. I don't really view I don't really view semi-glutide as a contest prep tool. No. If I don't, if you're yeah. if you're severely obese and you have disordered leptin and ghrelin and you're have a hard time controlling your appetite then yes then maybe that's something that can get you to a place where you can actually control your appetite but i feel like if you're a bodybuilder yeah you should have mastered that ability to control your appetite and not be so fat that you have to starve yourself yeah. to the point where appetite's an issue anyway i was gonna say the same thing not popular opinion but if you're if if that's something you really struggle with and you need a drug to stop yourself from overeating, bodybuilding is probably not the right sport for you. Right. The only thing that I've ever struggled with, and again, it's probably a body type thing, being a naturally leaner person is hypoglycemia from dieting hard. Yeah, I get uh, hypoglycemic. But it appears that growth hormone keeps the blood sugar up a little bit higher so you don't get the dips like that. Oh, um, that is a note that I wanted to make too. I drop the Lantus when I go on yeah, contest prep. Say definitely. I think the, I ran it the first couple of weeks, but even just adding in some cardio and dropping to one high day a week, I started going hypo. Yep. Just between meals from from the Lantus, which totally. is crazy. Yeah, and I a lot was, of guys want to. Sorry, a lot of guys want to use insulin while they're dieting for the wrong reasons, right? It's not gonna. It you, you're not gonna overdo thermodynamics, so it doesn't make a lot of sense on a high day. It does, but like to run right. it just in the background when you're dieting is dumb dangerous yeah i've seen coaches actually have people run a few units of insulin for before fasted cardio and stuff i'm yeah. like why well, 
because they think that it's somehow going to like glucagon and it's going to somehow, you know, release more fat. It, it doesn't really work like that. And it's, it's dangerous and it's not needed and it defies physics. You can't store, you know, you're not storing glycogen when you're in a calorie deficit. You're not storing no. anything. No, I will use it on high day. But That's once different. again, once again, I, last year at the end of my prep, I was so, I, I get, you know, even though I have pancreatic insufficiency, I guess I was so, my cells were so insulin sensitive that I did not need, and I would go hypo just on like three units yep. of Humalog with, with 150, 200 grams of carbs. Which, so I, once again, I let my glucose levels dictate the need for insulin. Yep. And which for guys that are struggling with insulin sensitivity, the easiest way to improve that is just to get leaner. Right. Right. Oh, you I mean, definitely see it. And that's why that post contest window for the rebound is so great because gastric emptying is high. Yeah. Insulin sensitivity is high. Your motivation to get back in the gym. As soon as you get some food in you, your workouts <laughs> just yeah. get insane. Pumps are insane. Why waste that? No, I agree. So anyway, um, at nine weeks out, I ac think actually I added it at 10. I added in trend. And I used to run trend a lot higher. I get a, I don't know why people get so sen sensitive and angry about this. They call me a liar when I say I'm only running 20 milligrams of trend a day, 140 a week. But that's all I all I need. I found that that is a high enough dose where I can get the cosmetic effect from it without all the side effects such as insomnia. I still get I still get the sweats at night. I still it affects my sleep some, but not so bad where I need to take a freaking ambient to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to again, it's 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 a not a straight comparison, but just so people can put it in perspective. If you go back to the parabolin, the original human grade trend, the after there was an initial front load, but after that the dose was it was one ampule every 10 days, which one ampule at 76 milligrams yielded exactly 50 milligrams of trend every 10 days, which is 35 milligrams of trend a week. And that yeah. was an effective amount for, you know, people with osteoporosis or, or wasting. So you're not far off in your dose where it's not to say that you can't get, I mean, the anabolic effect in humans seems to continue all the way to hundred milligrams a day. That doesn't mean you need to do that right? It's like, just because a human body can tolerate something doesn't mean you need to always push to that amount. And just, just to note, this is trimbalone acetate that I'm running. Yes. Yep. Once again, fast in, fast out. That's why parabolin, people think there's something mythic or special about parabolin. That, what is it? Hexabicarbonate? What is the, uh, the ester? It's a super uh, long ester. Yeah. Hexyl, um, carbonyl phenylpropanate or something yeah it, yeah it's a, it's a really random obscure ester and they really only used it because the weight the molecular weight would yield exactly 50 milligrams so they actually reverse engineered it they were looking oh, to come up with 50 milligrams so they had to figure out what acid they could attach to it to yield that that's interesting it wasn't like a half-life they needed a certain half-life too but it wasn't it, that was more about the dose well i don't want that trend lingering in my system for months after contest prep i want it out I want to be able to sleep. I want to be able to get back into my rebound phase and off season. So fast in, fast out. That's why I run with Trent, Trent Ace. I um, also, you know, guys want to run in Anthe because they have less frequent shots and stuff. I'm like, just don't be a pansy. If you're a bodybuilder, you're going to be shooting stuff every day on contest prep. Yeah. And the effect is greater for the acetate. C correct. And so, I run it every day. It's interesting. I just heard Dorian Yates on an interview talk about his pre-contest cycle, and he said he ran typically two or three parabolins a week on contest prep. Yep. So that math works out to exactly what I'm running. This notion, and I see a lot of guys running 100 milligrams of trend a day, that seems to be pretty typical, or 50 milligrams of trend a day for contest prep. That's insane to me. <laughs> I've done it before. I've gone up to 50 or going up to 100 a day and I couldn't sleep. Yep. I was just sweating. I felt awful. Yeah, I felt like I had the flu. So I added in the trend. Another thing to note, and I did not put it on here, is I added 
injectable L carnitine mm -hmm. this year. I don't know if it made any difference. I had some given to me for free. I figured what the heck I'll try it. So I've been running 500 milligrams of L carnitine a day, whether it's made any difference or not. I don't know. Well, we can, you and I could probably do a video on that sometime. It's, it's debatable. So people use it because it's, it's a, a transport, right? For fat into the mitochondria. Right. The issue is it's not the rate limit in fat burning. So in theory, the human body produces plenty of L-carnitine. It's acetyl coenzyme A that's at the top of the Krebs cycle. That's actually the rate limit, but you can't supplement with that. That being said, it doesn't mean taking L-carnitine is useless as other functions. It's not necessarily going to be used as a fat shuttle, right? It has some role in the androgen receptor and other things like that, but and it's not causing harm. So, yeah, I figured it wasn't hurting anything. Why not? I'll try it. So you can see here at eight weeks out, I just amended that. I added in the aromatase inhibitor. I'm running a nastrozole at a half a milligram mm -hmm. every other day. I will tell you, as soon as I add trend in, and as soon as I add in an aromatase inhibitor within days, my, my body just transforms. Yeah. I oh, get a definitely. harder look. I dump off all the excess water that I had on me. It completely changes how I look. Now, I do not see that until I get to a certain level of leanness. I think you have to be around 10% body fat or lower. Yeah, and you don't. That's also probably when you start waking up and peeing in the middle of the night, too. Yeah, yeah. You get to that point of prep where you're peeing three or four times a night. Yeah, that's partly from the estrogen dropping out like that. So you can see here, that pretty much stayed the same until week six. And then we added in the clin. Started off at 20 and I just taper up 20, 40, 60. I am at 80 micrograms of clin. I am running injectable clin right now. Helios. I am Helios. It is, it is the one that I'm running. It's 40 milligrams or micrograms of trend per milliliter and three and a half milligrams of L car or not L carnitine, but of Johambine. Mm -hmm. And then there's L carnitine in it. So that's the one that I'm running right now. And you spot, you're spot injecting that or just sub Q? I am spot injecting, injecting it into my love handles. Okay. That makes sense. That's how I would use it. Because that's the area that doesn't want to seem to go away. Whether it helps or not, I don't know. I am probably going to pull it the last two weeks starting this weekend and go to the, um, go back to an oral Clem, because I've noticed that I'm getting some lumps on my skin. I want to have my skin nice and clear for the show. I'm getting like these little spots on my, on my, and also we upped the Masteron dose to 800 milligrams. Okay. And that's you using Masteron and Amphate as well, not propanate. Correct. Okay. I just, I, I, I knew the answer to that. I was for everyone listening. Yes. That's, that's what I'm running. And so. You can see I ramped up the anastrozole to half a milligram every day. Then it, last week I went up to one milligram every day. And then I added in some tamoxifen as well. Okay. I have a little bit of gyno on my right pec. I've had gyno surgery done twice on my left and once on my right. I probably need to go get my right cleaned up again. Also, tamoxifen seems to help. I, you know, it seems to help with getting some of that extra stubborn fat off as well. Yeah, some interesting, um, <clears throat> again, sometimes the actual hard science doesn't line up with what we see in practice. So two interesting things is statistically speaking, there's no difference in outcome with men between 0.5 Arimidex and one milligram. It seems to yield the same amount of estrogen blockage. Um, but I find in person, it does make a difference. Yeah. Right. And the other thing is technically adding tamoxifen to Arimidex lowers the effectiveness of the Arimidex. But again, it doesn't mean in practice you're really getting that much less of an effect from it. I just know that if you were to look at the drug interactions, they actually claim that they interact negatively. Yeah, and sometimes I'll switch to letrozole at the end too. But I, harsh. Yeah, the problem with letrozole is it will make your joints scream. I yeah. My joints get so dried out. I feel awful. I have no energy. What I have seen, and this is once again 100% bro science, anecdotal, information and i've seen in on tons of contest preps is that that combination of an astrozole and tamoxifen at the end gets you very dry i don't know why maybe it's unnecessary maybe it's just complete bro science and you don't need it 
I don't know, but that's how I run it towards the end of prep. Yep. And you're not pulling the test out as well. No, I leave the test in. I found when I pull, you know, some people ask me why I leave the test in. I found when I pull the test out, I get flat as a pancake. Mm -hmm. I just shrivel up. I look flat. I don't have that nice full look. And I feel like this combination that I'm running, I can keep some fullness while getting extremely hard as well. That's what I found works for me. Yep. For orals, I, I kick in the orals at five weeks out, or four weeks out. Sorry. I used to run Winstraw. I do think Winstraw gives you a harder look, but Winstraw makes me feel like absolute crap. Once again, achy joints. I can't train. And I don't know why with Winstraw, I've seen in the past that Winstraw just blows my liver values up. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I've seen guys run 200 milligrams of Winstraw going into shows. If I did that, I probably would die. The last yeah, time I... It's more, it's more toxic than some of the other orals. Which is interesting to me because I throw halo testing in at the end and my liver values are better with halo testing than they are with Winstraw. Well, and halo is actually less suppressive. It doesn't fully suppress the HPTA where Winstraw does. Hmm. Right. So Winstraw's uh, halo testing is harsher in other metrics, but not, not quite. Winstraw, I would, Winstraw is probably one of the worst ones for you. Anadrol would probably be the worst, I would say. Superdrol. So coming into peak week, generally what we'll do is I drop injectables going into peak week. The main reason you drop them is you just don't want lumps on you. It's the esters that we're running with the exception of the trend. Everything's going to be hanging out. Sometimes the trend, because I'm running such a low dose and I'm shooting with an insulin needle, I'll run that all the way up until a couple of days before the show. doesn't seem to affect hardness any, but you don't want to get on stage with any lumps on you. So usually somewhere between five to seven days out from the show, we'll drop all the injectables, including the growth hormone. And then I will, the last two weeks, there's 20 milligrams of halo testing put in, and then I'll up the Anavar to hundred milligrams the last two weeks. And then there's no, there's no injectables the last week going into the show. It's just orals and, and, Sometimes I will even drop the fat burners going into the show. Usually I taper off fat burners coming out. Right, honestly, to, to be honest with you right now, I have been experimenting with not running any fat burners on the high day at all, just to give my yeah, glycogen CNS, refill. To, to allow my glycogen to refill, to give my CNS a break, to get some sleep. I yeah. My logic is, is that you're not burning any fat on that day anyway. So why waste... <laughs> or tax your system with additional fatigue from those drugs on that day. I don't know if it is costing me anything. Maybe that's why I can't get that right, last little bit not. of stubborn fat off. But I mean, the only argument I could say to the the opposite, but it's not necessarily valid, is you could say it, it at least clombuterol will cause some nutrient partitioning. But if you're already on Trembolone, that's going to be a stronger nutrient partitioner. Right. And like you said, you're not really burning any fat that day. And then the third point that we just touched on was the, you know, the, it, it does mess with their insulin sensitivity to some extent, how much is debatable. So if you're trying to force carbs in and now you're messing up your insulin sensitivity, it seems counterproductive to me. I, I would drop it as well on those days. That's been my approach this year. I've been experimenting with that. I haven't done that with my clients. I just wanted to see how it worked on me. Uh, but so far, so good. And then post show, we're going to taper off everything. You don't, that's a mistake I think people make is they, they drop. drop all the fat burners cold turkey and they have this metabolic crash post show and they eat a bunch of food. They don't work out. Same thing with the cardio. I'll taper the cardio down post show over a couple of weeks and then shift into my rebound phase. I think for my rebound this year, I'm just going to run test and primo. Cool. Just keep it simple. I that think I, what I found. One of the big problems that you run into post-show, and I've run into it with some of my clients, is the water rebound. I've had that issue with myself, is you had this rapid accumulation of water post-show, and I've had some people with massive edema in their ankles and stuff, and I used to run NPP post-show, and I feel like that just exacerbates it and makes it worse. Yeah. So this year, I'll probably stick with something drier post-show. I think you have an estrogen rebound post show, so I'll probably taper off the AIs or use a suicide A high. I don't know, or just just let the test and the primo do what it's going to do. Yeah, you might be fine the way it is. Yeah, but anyway, that's the plan. 
that's how I put it together. Now, keep in mind, none of this stuff is set in stone. I sort of mapped this out beforehand, but some things were adjusted differently. Like I delayed adding the ex some of the extras. I delayed the orals until just now. I didn't feel like I needed them. My workouts were still good. I didn't feel like I needed the extra push from the Anovar. So I this week with the cut and food, I was feeling pretty miserable you know, this past week. So the Anovar helped me get through the workouts and keep my pumps and keep some fullness during the workout. Also, you know, it's the anabolic or anti-catabolic effect of Anovar as mm -hmm. well. Something you would probably agree with. I, I would find that you can have a plan for peak week or for two weeks out, whatever like you would hear, you don't generally know, you don't know as an athlete, you don't know as a coach what it's really going to look like until you're there. Right. Where these things might change. So I would say any coach who, who shows you what peak week looks like or the, or two weeks out or three weeks out when you're 12 weeks out, it's good to have an idea, but it's, it's not accurate. And they're, they're full no. of they, they know what you're going to do. How could you possibly know? You don't. And I have a framework for peak week that I operate from, but I have people check in with me daily going into peak week the last few days, multiple times a day. And we will, I'll give them that framework and the outline so they're comfortable and they understand what things look like, but be prepared for changes. Yep. hundred percent. And, and sometimes that, that framework, I, I've done this enough now where that framework is accurate about 80% of the time. We don't really have to make changes, but sometimes we do. Sometimes people retain water. Sometimes people flatten out and we have to adjust things diuretics that's another thing that people yep. ask me about all the time it's sort of a touchy subject but i generally do not need a diuretic i get pretty dry easily and the only thing that i found with diuretic is that it flattens me out if i need it i'll run something mild like hydrochlorothiazide or thiazide maybe the night before the show if i need it i have found that i generally do not if you're lean and your water manipulation is correct, and your diet is on point, most of the time you can walk on stage without a diuretic. You don't need it. It's just what I found. It I never made sense. 100%, yeah. It never made sense to me, too. I see a lot of guys running diuretics when they're trying to load glycogen. Like, how in the world can you be pushing water out and load glycogen at the same time? Yeah. No, dude, I'm with you. I think the... We, when you were talking about leaving the test in, but the AIs, the only thing that I do differently is I tend to switch testosterone to propanate, not necessarily because it's any different in effect and anything different in the effect, but just so it gives the option to pull it fast if it needs to be pulled. Yeah. But like you pulling tests tends to make people look flat and it's not the greatest idea. And you don't want to pull test and run an AI. I've seen some of the, some of the guys on the Olympia stage, when you look at some of their protocols now, they run both. AIs and remove tests. And I'm not really sure what the point of that is because you're not aromatizing anything at that point. No, you're not. It seems like a big, it, it's going to cause a lot of gastric distress too. Bio production goes down the toilet. It's, it's not necessarily, to me, it doesn't yield a good look. You, you're going to do one or the other. Yeah. And there are some, you know, you brought up a point there with the bio production. It gets shitty towards the end of prep as you crush estrogen and you throw, you know, your stomach, it's all out of sorts yep. with, with the orals and stuff i have added in to help with everything like what i run at the end as far as supplements go i use ox bile and tucka at the end of the shows towards the end that seems to help with everything keeps my stomach working i am taking a fiber supplement i run nac and nac and milk thistle as well you know so so tucka to help with bile flow and it seems to keep my liver values in line for the most part, like last year, I came out on my show and my my liver values were just very moderately elevated, very moderately. I've seen guys come in, come out of shows, and I've been there before. I think one time my my ALT and AS, AST were like seven hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you don't feel well when no, I'm sure you don't. Like no, last year it was like in the fifties, post show. Yeah, which is totally which is no, bodybuilding normal. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, bodybuilding normal, exactly. That's, um, that's bodybuilding normal. But that's it. That is it right, right there. That's that's everything. I don't know if you have any comments or are you, thoughts on it, but this, this is my framework. This is my logic. This is how I do it. No, I mean, I would do, 
I would do pretty much the exact same thing. Did, you talked about pulling growth hormone. When were you pulling growth? Usually it's a fine line with the growth hormone. Too. I, I've heard Vigor Steve was talking about growth hormone loading the day of the show. He said he'll know, do a he high dose. That. Yeah, it was interesting. A high dose growth hormone the day of the show, which I've never considered. I usually pull it out three or four days before. It seems like that allows the water to flush out. And then you just shrink wrap after that. It, 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 definitely you're retaining some water from the growth yeah, hormone. That's what I would be concerned with. You do lose fullness. That's the trade-off. Yeah. I see, I don't notice any water retention generally from staying at the same dose. I would just be concerned bringing the dose up. Would yeah, no, I would not increase. outcome that you just don't know what to do, right? Where that again will level out, but if you're only doing for one day right before a show, you don't know what you're getting into. At least and I would is, be nervous to do it. That is another thing you have to be careful with. Two weeks out from a show is generally the last time I would want to modulate any of the PEDs up. 10 days, something like that, I would not want to increase because sometimes even with dry compounds, you'll see some shifts in water retention. Yes. Um, when you add stuff, aldosterone, right. I guess, just is out of whack. Well, and your cortisol, I think cortisol levels are really screwy at that point, right? You're not sleeping. Yep. And even, even Tremblone being a dry thing, it's, it can stress the kidneys depending on the dose, depending on the person. Right. Depending on your kidney health. I've seen water retention from Tren. And, and that's not like a, it, people are going to think that's some sort of progesterone response or something. It's, it's more just a, a overall body stress inflammation. It's, it's, it's in a big dose. It's stressful. Well, less I'm moving there. parts going into the peak week, the less opportunity there is for screw ups. So yeah. I, my thought process is I want as few variables as possible going into peak week. Yep. And I think running the VAR and the halo in solo. What about uh Winstraw? Did you, were you pulling that or you running I don't in? run. I am not running Winstraw because okay. it just makes me feel awful, man. Okay. I thought about adding it, but I find that Anavar gets me about 80% Okay. There, and also with Anovar, like with Winstraw, you don't get the pumps in the motivation in the gym yep. that the you do. Area. You know, Winstraw doesn't do that for you. So I feel like the added benefit of that from the Anovar outweighs any cosmetic benefit that you're getting from the Winstraw. I don't know, but I, I know Winstraw is the standard protocol for most people yeah. going into shows. So maybe I have it wrong, but that's what no, I, do. I think. And I leave I it up to my that. clients. I tell them if they want to run one straw, that's fine. That's just my preference. What I found that works for me. I would say I, the biggest benefit from the wind straw would probably be when the guys are mega dosing it, right? The 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams is when you're really going to see it shine. Yeah. Add 50 in to add 50 milligrams of wind straw in on top of this to get a little minor effect. Plus the negative health stuff from it doesn't seem worth it to me. I feel like if you're going to run it, you run it. Yeah. And I've never truly tried that. Maybe I should. Well, I mean, you look great now. I don't know if you need, I wouldn't revisit anything right now. Yeah, I wouldn't change any variables for the show, but this is just my my thought process here. And I know talking to John Jewett, he's a advocate of Anavar. He runs Anavar going into shows. He, the only thing he does a little differently that would, from talking to him is he'll, he'll hit a dose of Anadrol the day of the show, which I've never tried. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, he said he'll take some manager all the day of the show to help with pumps and filling out. I've heard rumors that some of the guys in the late 70s and early 80s used to mess with that. But I think yeah, it, to I mean, me, it would be very unpredictable. Like the water retention. Is, that would be my worry. You know. That would be my worry. I, I use, really, if I'm going to manipulate anything on show day, it would be just a little more food and a little more liquid. Yeah, and then safe. I'll use, that'll get you what you need. If you So usually what I'll tell people if they're backstage – and we can't see veins, they can't get a pump, then it's real simple. You just need carbs, fluid, and salt. And that'll fix the problem. Yeah, it's generally but I would, not your issue. I would rather run a little flat getting on stage. This is a, something that people have to keep in mind. What looks good in the mirror doesn't always look good on stage. There's gym big and there's stage big. What looks good on stage is generally running a little bit on the flat side. Yep. Yeah. I would always rather, I would always rather for myself and for my athletes to come in a little bit drier, a yep. little bit, a little bit 
flatter than full and spilled over, right? Or the or the method you and I have talked about before where guys will overfill and then try to clean it up with diuretics. That to me is a risky too. Yeah, the old fill and spill method that I think a lot of yeah. the guys from the early 2000s and late 90s used. It's one of those things that can be brilliant when it hits and not so good when it doesn't. I think you can look at Big Rami from this past year if you want to see what the result of it is. And Regan Grimes as well, I think, right? Yeah. Italy, Italy pro. That's what yeah, like me. I'm pretty sure that's, you know, I don't know Milos's protocol specifically, but what I've seen that he gets very aggressive with the carb up and then clean, tries to clean it up afterwards. And I know Chad Nichols, who works with a lot of the big guys, will have his guys go eat like pizza and things like that and a couple days out and then try to clean them up before going into the show. And it, when it works, it looks great. When it doesn't, it doesn't. I, yeah. For me, especially for a guy at a local show, I play a conservative. I don't want to get hyper aggressive with doing any Hail Mary passes at the end. I just, for me, for unless you're competing for a national championship or a pro card or at the pro level, you're trying to qualify for the Olympia. Those are the times that maybe you want to throw a Hail Mary pass. I don't know, but I would rather play a conservative. I get more consistent results that way. Yep. The worst thing you can do, it's a balance to, and that's why like with local shows, I generally don't, don't futz around with diuretics either because if you don't have a lot of experience and you get up on stage and you start cramping up that there's nothing worse nope. than that and you can see it you can always tell who's using them yeah you can see it you can see like there was a guy at my last show who looked like he was about six weeks out who had no business using diuretics and he was backstage tremoring cramping up and he was begging people for water. He's like, anybody got water? Anybody got Gatorade? Anybody got water? Anybody got Gatorade? It was like, it was horrific, man. I'm like, dude, go get a fucking IV. The paramedics over there. Yeah. Cause he knows they'll pick him out once he does that. Yeah. You don't need to be, you're not going to win anyway. No, <laughs> you, you got a last place physique. So that's why with a local show, you just play a little more conservative. And it seems like this year, the judges have been rewarding fullness more anyway. So <laughs> I don't know, but I, to me, it's just get in shape, get all the fat off. If you get all the fat off, pose. you're going to look good on stage. And if you know how to pose, it's really that simple. Yeah, no magic there. But I really appreciate you sharing all this. Yeah, that's With it, me man. And everybody else. Sorry to ramble a lot. That was a, no, was man, a lot of information. Fantastic. No, I think that it's good for people to see like a real life, right? Because I mean, a lot of these guys have no real world experience with this stuff outside of their own experimentation. Where, you know, and you I get and I people kind of stuff all the time. I get people telling me that this is a high dose cycle. I promise you, it's not a high dose cycle for a guy on a for a local show, maybe, but for a guy on a national stage, this is pretty typical. It might even be on the low side. I, I mean, it, and I've you and I've talked about this a million times of the people that I've interacted with and the people I've coached. I, I don't know if there's really a definition. I've seen guys, I've seen guys at the pro level use less than a gram. Yep. I've seen guys use 10,000 milligrams. I've seen amateurs use that same amount. And I've, you know, I, I don't know if there's any standard amount of anything. There are more standard ranges probably, but I, I it's hard to say what's high and what's low. It depends on the person. Could I get away with less? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I don't Maybe. think it does, doesn't look abusive to me. I mean, it's a limited run. We're mashing the gas pedal down for a period of time and then I'll pull back. It, generally in off season for me like in the past this this year has been the most aggressive i have ever been and i think it's the best i've looked generally for me in off season in the past has been something like 750 tests and 600 of an anabolic that's typically what i run it's nothing crazy yeah no and i don't think it needs to be i think that's about food at, the, at that point all right man that's all i got that's for good, you man i appreciate it thank you for coming yeah. on again any any parting questions? Anything you wanna wanna end with? No, man. I feel like you covered everything. You know. No, it, it's it, it's pretty much exactly how I would do it. And I will I tell people. It. Everybody says they're going to prep themselves. <laughs> Good luck. You, you need a coach. And I have yeah. people tell me, "Well, Dorian Yates prepped himself." Well, there was only one er Dorian Yates ever. Yeah. I know what when I'm he doing. Had Kenny, he had Kenny, he had he had Paul with him all the time. Yeah, he had people in his ear. So 
I um, think I'm pretty objective and I know what I'm doing and I would not want to coach myself because you get to the end of contest prep and your brain starts playing tricks on you. You see mirages in the mirror. Like one day I think I'm fat. The next day I think I'm, I'm getting too small and it leads to rash decisions. I yeah. see guys all the time. I have people that I coach. I'm not calling anybody particular out that second guess things and start doing freelancing yep. and they screw up the prep. Yep. Well, that's why you're my coach. Right. So yep. I don't need to think about that. I don't want to think about this stuff. I do it all day long with other people. I don't need to think about it for me. It's very hard to be objective about yourself. And I'm not trying to sell people on coaching, but it's just the facts. It's impossible to be objective about yourself, especially when you're calorie depleted, tired, doing a shit ton of cardio yep. at the end of prep, you're, you're emotional your brain's not working right. So no, I'm with spend, you. spend the money and pay some money. And if you can't afford it, don't do a show. <laughs> yeah. I agree with all that. All right, man. That's all I got for you. Yeah. And we'll have your your link tree and everything listed below. I think people know where to get me. Yeah. They know where to find <laughs> you. They know where to find me. Um, cool. Thanks so much, Paul. All right, man. Thank Good you. Good luck. Take care.